Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everyone. Uh, welcome to our expert dialogue episode four, Neutralizing Antibody, Emerging Role in COVID-19 Pandemic, presented by Wonderful Biotech and Indonesia Infectious Disease Society. Thank you all for joining us today to discuss the, I can say the eye-catching topic nowadays, the neutralizing antibody application. And this is Amber from Wonderful Biotech, and I'm very honored to be the moderator for today's webinar. Uh, since the outbreak of the COVID-19, the whole world has been stick together to come up with the measures for fighting against and control the spread of the COVID, whether from diagnostic or therapy or prevention point of view. Among them, vaccines are no doubt the cornerstone and surest means for pandemic control and prevention. And since the rollout of vaccine and start of vaccine uh, vaccination campaign, neutralizing antibody testing has become the attractive topic in both research and clinical field. Due to its unique role in immunity, it has been pushed on the stage of massive vaccination era and become one of the focus. However, since its application is relatively new and still under the process of exploring, we urgently need sharing by professionals and experts to kind of let us know the significance of neutralizing antibody and how I can help in the whole vaccination program. That's why we invited two experts today who I know have been paying a lot of attention to neutralize antibodies since the very beginning of the vaccine rollout. Now, please allow me to introduce the panelists today. Uh, first, Professor Ashok. Professor Ashok Ratan is the medical biologist by profession. He was conferred AP, APJ Abdul Kalam Award for Lifetime Contribution to Medical Science in 2018. And Shrini was oration in 2021 by India Association of Microbiologists for his contribution to laboratory diagnosis of tuberculosis. He is at present advice in Pascal Laboratory. He has held many important positions in academics as well. Um, he is additional professor in All India Institute of Medical Science, demonstrator and lecturer in JN Medical College, and I can see so many other professional and outstanding titles of you. So welcome, Professor Ashok. Yeah, thanks for joining us today. Uh, do you want to say hi to our audience? Hello, good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, wherever you are. <laughs> thank you, thank you for joining us today. Uh, and our next panelist is Dr. Badi Alishabana. Dr. Badi is a internalist, infectionologist, and the active clinician in the internal medicine department in Hassan Sadikan Hospital. Currently, he also holds a position as the head of research center for care and control of infectious disease at University Panjajaran. Uh, he is also the head of Indonesia Infectious Disease Society, West Java Branch, and the secretary of the National TB Expert Committee and a member of Indonesian National Academy of Science. Welcome, Dr. Badi. Thank you very much for the introduction. Hello, all. Good evening, good afternoon, good morning. <laughs> yeah, thank you, Dr. Badi, and also uh, Professor Ashok. Uh, it's very glad to have you both today. And uh, I know Dr. Badi is a professional in internal medicine, while Professor Ashok is the expert in laboratory medicine. So I believe for today's sharing, it will cover from clinical to laboratory aspects. So we're very looking forward to that. And here is a quick notice for our audience. Uh, if you have any questions during the speech, uh, you can either submit your question via the QA section at the bottom of your screen or direct send them to the chat box. We will bring them out during the QA session. Okay, without any further ado, let's begin today's keynote speech. Uh, first, welcome Professor Ashok to bring his sharing, role of neutralizing antibodies in COVID-19 infection and vaccination. So, Professor, yeah, Professor Ashok, you may start.
Today we'll discuss about role of neutralizing antibodies in infection and vaccination. Uh, you know that severe acute respiratory syndrome, coronavirus 2, has two very important antigens. One is nuclear capsid protein, which is inside the cell. And the second is on the surface, the spike protein. Natural infection begins by the virus binding to the ACE2 receptors present on the surface of the cell, of human cells. And our aim to block this from starting is we hope that neutralizing antibodies will bind to spike protein and prevent the binding of the virus to the ACE2 receptor so that they will not be able to enter into the cell. That antibodies play a very important role was brought out by Miller uh, from Boston who investigated everybody admitted in Boston to the hospital with diagnosis of COVID infection. And they did RT-PCR as well as antibodies on each one of them. And they found that in the first nine days, RT-PCR was the best method for diagnosis. But after the ninth day, antibodies played an important role in diagnosis. And by the third week, nearly 100% of persons were having antibodies while RT-PCR's contribution to diagnosis was decreasing. They suggested that when used as a complementary test with RT-PCR, serology can function as a reliable diagnostic aid for identification of recent or prior infection. But of course, not in the first week. From Zhao had also mentioned that not everybody produces very strong antibodies. It's only those who were admitted in, uh, in ICUs with critical infection would have high titer of antibodies, while those who had mild infection had very low titers. This might explain why many convalescent plasma trials which did not look for neutralizing antibodies, gave different results and some failed. In the initial part, it was thought that just like in dengue and in Zika virus, antibodies may have a double-edged sword, not only good aspects, but also bad. But luckily, the antibody-associated cell toxicity has not been observed with COVID infection. We now know that COVID infection can be divided into three stages. First is the infection stage where the viral load is high. Second would be the respiratory stage. And if by that time, natural immunity does not set up and we do not have neutralizing antibodies, then the cytokine storm might kick in and that might prove fatal that infection causes protection as a subsequent and uh, gives resistance to reinfection was demonstrated uh, in the experiment with monkeys where monkeys who recovered could not be reinfected. When, and when plasma was transferred to Syrian hamsters, the hamsters were protected, indicating that it was antibodies which was offering protection by blocking the union of spike receptors with ACE2 receptors. This was then also demonstrated in the then President Donald Trump, who was given a cocktail of two monoclonal antibodies and he recovered within days of receiving monoclonal antibodies. Again, it's been demonstrated that if you look for neutralizing antibodies and there are high titers of neutralizing antibodies, then if those plas that plasma is transfused into persons who, are, who have comorbidity, within 72 hours of the person turning out to be RT-PCR positive, then the progression would not occur and serious disease will be prevented. 
it's because of this that the spike protein, because of realization that spike protein plays an important role, that most of the modern vaccines have focused on spike protein as the antigen in various forms. The spike protein is a trimeric protein. It has S1 and S2. S1 has the receptor binding domain, which binds to the ACE2 receptor. In the receptor binding domain also, there is a region known as receptor binding motif, which consists of about 70 amino acids, which really binds to the ACE2 receptor. And mutations in the receptor binding domain would lead to immune escape. In the recent past, the Delta variant not only has mutations in the receptor binding domain, but also has a mutation very near the fusion part of the peptide, leading to, ex and leading to better fusion with the human cells and therefore better infectivity. You see here that mutations are all over. The virus itself is nearly 30,000 30, 30, base pair and mutations occur all across. Mutations of interest and concern is when mutations occur within the receptor binding domain and various variants, alpha, beta, gamma, delta have been described, which have both increased infectivity and some of them have uh, immune escape mechanism. If 2020 was the, the D614G mutation, which led to increase in transmission, this year it has been the delta variant which has spread all over the world and is now the dominant variant causing infection. In serological tests, we have, uh, we can, uh, it depends upon what is the antigen we are using. We can use nuclear capsid protein, but remember nuclear capsid protein is within the virus while spike protein is jutting outside and antibodies to spike protein are the ones which are, which are neutralizing. And we could then first focus on S1 or S2 or the trimeric portion of the spike protein, or we can focus on receptor binding domain. The antibodies that we detect could be total. That means we are not differentiating between IgM, IgG, and IgA or we can look for IgG and neutralizing antibodies are IgG in nature. And looking at type of assay, it could be binding assays or neutralizing assays. And there are various ways of neutralizing assays. Then is the choosing the right format. The easiest format, which is patient centric, would be lateral flow. The advantage of lateral flow is that it can use only one drop or two drops of, of whole blood and the results will be available within 20 minutes or so, but it is not very sensitive. So attempts have been made to quantify the results to make it better as point of care testing. The next one is ELISA, which many labs can do. And of course, center labs will prefer automated systems because the workload is high and the sensitivity and specificity of chemiluminescence is far superior than anything else. Now, not all serological tests are the same. If you use nuclear capsid protein as the antigen, since the antigen is within the cell and it has no role in protection, you would only be able to answer whether a person has been infected or not. On the other hand, if you want to know whether a person has now any protection, then you can look at, certain, at spike protein, which is as a surrogate for protection. 
these are binding antibodies. They, if they bind to S2 or S1, then they will be binding antibodies. For neutralization, you can imagine that a person walks in to your room with a knife. If you can hold his arm or hand, which has the knife, then you have neutralized him. On the other hand, if you hold his leg or his neck, then though you have bound him, but he may still be able to hurt. That is the difference between neutralization and binding. If you want to look at neutralization, then the virus, what it does is that in, it, it infects cultured cells and digs holes in them by causing cytopathogenic effect. This cytopathogenic effect can be neutralized. And so this becomes the plaque reduction neutralization test, also known as the print test. But for doing this, what is done is that virus is taken and it is mixed with antibodies and then poured over the surface of cultured cells. And subsequently in three to five days, we would be able to find out whether there's any neutralization of the plaques. So there'll be a control serum and there'll be a test serum and we can see whether there's any difference. The advantage of this is that this actually replic replicates what happens inside the body, human body. But it needs DSL-3 laboratories because you're working with a live virus, which is highly infectious and it takes three to five days. So though this test may be suitable for national research and reference labs, it's not suitable for diagnostic lab. So scientists then modified that knowing that it's the spike protein that we're interested in, they removed the virus, uh, the nuclear capsid of the virus and changed it and put the spike gene into a harmless virus so that the spike protein is still expressed and it will act with receptor, but the virus will not cause infection. This was then the scientists in China first established the test, then they published the protocol in nature. And when the infection went to, uh, went to Italy, Italians also got a simplified version. This made it possible for the test to be performed in clinical laboratories, which normally have biosafety level two, but it would still take three to five days. Now, to make it simpler, genetically engineered receptor binding domain and ACE2 receptors were created and an ELISA system which, in which uh, ACE2 receptors will be bound to the ELISA plate. And then after you have acted separately with plasma or serum and RBD, then the residual one will be poured over the ELISA plates and you would then see whether the RBD has been neutralized by antibodies present or absent in the plasma is there or not. So this becomes a cell-free, virus-free assay, which can be performed in any equipped lab. This was then uh, tested with patients and controls and both in Singapore and China, and they got excellent results. Uh, subsequently, the test was approved by, was given uh, emergency use authorization by USFDA, has also been approved by Indian Council of Medical Research and DCGI, and there have been a number of companies which have been able to make this. And good results, other manufacturers too can provide uh, tests which will give equivalent results. As you see on the right side, if R2 is 0.9, that means you can use either of the two tests. And there seem to be a few kits available which will give you equivalent results. Last year, when this test was not available, we had tested using nuclear capsid protein, 
which looked at whether a person has been infected or not, and S1 and S2, which showed whether a person has protection. In this, you would notice that out of the 2000 odd that we tested, 552 were positive. While when we looked at the protection, we noticed that uh, arbitrarily unit of 15 and above was taken as positive, but most of the persons who had antibodies were at low level of protection. Subsequently, this year, after India has gone through the second wave, which was because of Delta virus, we again tested using now neutralizing antibodies. And out of the 46 patients that we had, 16 were vaccinated and 16 were not vaccinated. And 13 got infected in the first wave and nine in the second wave. And when we looked at their neutralizing antibodies, we find that those who were infected and vaccinated had very high titers. Same was the case after vaccination, but as you see on the left side, vaccination alone produced various levels of uh, neutralizing antibodies. But uh, vaccination along with previous infection produced very high titers and nearly 100% uh, neutralization antibodies were produced in these persons. It was also been reported that healthcare workers who are zero positive, when they have one, whether they are asymptomatic or symptomatic, they will produce high titer antibodies. It's also been reported that if a person has pre-existing uh, is zero positive, then one dose of one dose of vaccine will produce high titer of antibodies, and a second dose of uh, a vaccine may not add much to it, while the second dose will definitely increase the number of systemic side effects would, which would occur in previously seropositive uh, positive individuals. But not everybody reacts. It was been reported that persons who are, uh, who are above the age of 65 have less reaction less antibody titers, and whether it is after the first dose or after the second dose, whether it is antibodies against the spike protein or neutralizing antibodies, and they remain susceptible to infection. Recently, effectiveness of COVID-19 vaccines against uh, the Delta va variant have been described, and they find that after the first dose, the both the vaccines under question here were effect, equally effective against alpha and delta variant. But after the second dose, the, um, the, the, it was much better. So they said only there was only modest loss of efficacy was noticed in vaccine efficacy after two doses. But the difference between the first dose and second dose was marked between alpha and delta. And uh, the vaccines were less effective if only one dose was given. And their recommendation is that we should maximize vaccine uptake with two doses amongst the vulnerable population as soon as possible. I have been talking about neutralizing antibodies, but uh, you would notice here that T cell response is occurring much before antibodies also appear. At the moment, there are papers available that mm, the T cell response may, uh, will be there even when humoral escape occurs. And there have been at least two different mm, test kits available. And it appears that low dose of vaccine generates durable T cell memory and antibody enhanced by pre-existing cross-reaction T cell memory and this might be lifelong. But we are still uh, concentrating on antibodies, and it appears that the vaccine will elicit neutralizing antibodies which will target receptor binding domain. And mono, human monoclonal antibodies, which will neutralize most of the variants have been made available. 
So those persons who do not generate neutralizing antibodies themselves should be given this as soon as a diagnosis of, of COVID infection has been, has been established, especially if they are immunocompromised or with comorbidity. What level is protective was determined in uh, was was determined in in monkeys where they in fact uh, they transfused different concentration of antibodies to the monkeys and they found that uh, the monkey which was completely protective had anti spike antibodies of 400 anti rbd antibodies of 100 titer and neutralizing antibodies more than 50 and uh, WHO has now recently set up the standard for binding arbitrarily unit, where, where whatever arbitrarily unit you have, you have to multiply that by 2.6. So our aim by using the neutralizing antibody test is to mimic nature and to act as a surrogate for neutralization to prevent the union of the virus with ACE2 receptors. It also appears that there are not only RBD is the site, but they seem to be about 18 epitopes on various parts of the, uh, the spike protein, which if bound by antibodies will neutralize. And recently a super antibody has been described, which will neutralize nearly all clades of the SARS-CoV-2. And this would have therapeutic evidence. So now why some persons die and others reco recover has been answered by this paper from, from Yale University. They indicate that mortality in COVID-19 correlates with delayed kinetics of neutralizing antibodies. If there are no, antibody, no neutralizing antibodies by day 14, then that infection might lead to death. So we know now that it's on the 14th day we should look for antibodies if a person has suffered from infection. The indication for testing, neutralizing antibody test is after vaccination, two weeks of second dose. And we, have, we should be happy if more than 30% of inhibition is present. After infection, 14 days of infection, if no neutralizing antibody, that might end fatally. And after infection, if planning to use monoclonal antibodies, especially in persons with comorbidity, we should do neutralization antibodies straight away. Because if neutralizing antibodies are present, then monoclonal antibodies will be of no use. But if they are absent, then monoclonal antibodies will be life-saving. But still, deviation from COVID appropriate behavior is currently the biggest variant of concern in our region. I thank you for your attention and hand you back to Amber. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Shark. Uh, that's a very content rich sharing. Um, I see you cover from the antibody response for COVID patients as well as for after vaccination and also to tell us how the antibody can help with the diagnosis and immunity indication and as well as the treatment. So we can see the neutralized antibody plays a very crucial role in all aspects. And Professor Ashok also shared the methods that are currently available uh, for the neutralizing antibody test. And he also gave suggestions of how and where to do the test, uh, which I think has a practical meaning for future application. So uh, thank you, Professor Ashok, for uh, give, your, give us your sharing. Um, after learning from the laboratory medicine perspective, then let's see how's the opinion from a professional clinician also an expert in the infectious disease. Uh, let's welcome Dr. Badi to give his keynote speech, uh, importance of antibody testing among vaccines and COVID-19 patients in Indonesia. Dr. Badi. Hello, thank you very much for the introduction, <clears throat> Amber. Thank you very much for, uh, for invitation for this uh, uh, speech. speech. Uh, my, uh, I would like to explain the importance of antibody testing among COVID-19 vaccine and patients. 
after the very complete explanation from Prof. Ashok, I'll try to put this into the perspective of a clinician who will use this uh, test. So the post-vaccine antibody test is still uh, very uh, much debated. Uh, there is a lot of pro and cons. The WHO said it's not necessary. The CDC said it's not needed. And the Indonesian Ministry of Health said that it is not necessary and misleading. Uh, but I think the need, uh, we need to consider this because one, vaccine distributed in Indonesia is not as efficacious as the one they use in US, for instance. And older age and comorbidities often have low vaccine response. And they are excluded in most trials, but they have the severe COVID. And hundreds of vaccinated health workers died in the last three months, after, even after vaccination. So uh, my talk, I hope I can answer this question. Uh, does high naturalism antibody and anti-RBD determine protection from COVID? What is the efficacy of vaccine use in Indonesia? What condition makes even lower vaccine efficacy? When to test anti-RBD in vaccine? When to use anti-RBD in clinical management? How do we interpret result and what cutoff level is adequate? So antibody response naturalization antibody and anti-RBD in COVID-19. COVID so as we know, I think from Prof. Ashok that we, uh, the antibody will start to increase in day 10, day 14, and the IgG are the antibody which stays longer, but eventually it will wane as well. Uh, it will wane and it will uh, be lower uh, as time goes by. Now, the, uh, one of the very uh, important paper uh, that shows that uh, antibody, high antibody titer is uh, protective is from this uh, paper from Aditya. This is a very uh, interesting story. A fishing boat of 122 crew where three persons have had COVID before they uh, get aboard to the ship. And they have high neutralizing antibody and high RBD antibody, as we see here. This is the three person. And in the ship, while, while they are sailing, 83% uh, get COVID. And the three person did not get COVID. This three person has uh, this neutralization and, uh, antibody titer and this uh, RBD IgG titer. And, and uh, when, the, when they become, when most of their friends become ill, they remain negative PCR up until the end. And, and then only one get a high PCR, but it's only very, very small viral load, but they didn't get ill. And, they, uh, and at the end, all the antibody, the IgG is similar with those who were not infected and those who were infected. So this is the first proof that uh, neutralizing antibody does uh, protect people from COVID. Next, uh, we talk about uh, neutralizing antibody uh, that needs a lot of uh, work in the laboratory to, do, to, to conduct it, like Prof. Ashok has mentioned. But then we have a more simple uh, test, the test for RBD IgG. Uh, I mentioned here in this uh, presentation as anti-RBD. And what we see here that the anti-RBD and the neutralization antibody has very good correlation. It's more than, um, it's 0 0.94. So we can uh, use either one. And the, there is many antibodies we can measure, but the SRBD IgG is the ones that has better, be best correlation with the neutralization test. So uh, how about efficacy and antibody response? in the vaccines that we know well. So we know the vaccine of the mRNA vaccine. This is the Pfizer vaccine. How do we compare between effic efficacy of the vaccine and how do we compare the antibody response of uh, the vaccine that we know well? So Pfizer, everyone knows well. And so what, what we see here in the Pfizer, this is all the uh, tests that they done in uh, various uh, vaccine with different dose, one milligram, 10 microgram, 30, 50, and so on. I, I put it in the more focus. And what we see here, actually, this is the one that they use is 30 microgram. And what we see here is that 
we can compare the efficacy of the vaccine based on the RBD uh, titer determination, and we can compare it with the uh, convalescent patients. And we see that in the Pfizer vaccine, that the result of the vaccine is higher than the uh, than the convalescent patient. Next, we know the Moderna is also very, very famous. And when we get into close, this is also the convalescent patient. And what we see, the titer they get from this vaccine is high. And this is uh, the 50 microgram and the 100 microgram is the one that they use and still are higher than the convalescent patient. So based on the convalescent patient, we can compare the uh, efficacy or the uh, antibody response of the vaccine. And this is the AstraZeneca vaccine. This is the convalescent patient. And what we see here is the response of the antibody. And we see that they are similar with the convalescent patient. So we can see that the efficacy of the, sorry, the antibody response from AstraZeneca is lower than the Moderna or the Pfizer. Now in Indonesia, we use a lot of Sinovac vaccine. But the problem with Sinovac vaccine in this paper is that they show a very uh, significant increase from non-vaccinated to vaccinated. But the problem in this paper is that they did not uh, provide us with the comparison of the uh, convalescent patient. So actually we did a small study in Indonesia and we uh, call upon volunteers who has been vaccinated by Sinovac. Uh, at one month uh, uh, after a second dose and three months after second dose. And we also call upon volunteer of uh, convalescent patients. Uh, they have COVID patient in the last two months before. And what we see here that the, uh, the median value of the vaccinated uh, people are lower than the convalescent patient. So what we can see here that the, uh, the antibody response of the uh, Sinovac vaccine is lower than uh, AstraZeneca, is lower than the Pfizer. But uh, it's not a bad vaccine because I think the, the, uh, there is, uh, it's very safe vaccine because what we see here now, there is not so much adverse effect that uh, affected the uptake of the vaccine. Okay. So, but uh, finally, uh, unfortunately, there is a, a very good paper uh, also uh, published in the Nature Medicine. And this uh, author have uh, conducted met, uh, mathematical modeling of the efficacy of the vaccine. And this efficacy is uh, generated based also on the neutralizing antibody. And what, what he draws here is that this is the convalescent patient if their antibody uh, distribution is ranging from here to here with one as the center, then the coronavac or the Sinovac vaccine is here. So it's lower than the convalescent patient. But AstraZeneca is here. It's a little bit lower, but still uh, close to the convalescent patient. But Moderna and Pfizer is in the higher, uh, uh, higher, higher than convalescent patient. And then the, in, they also put uh, this graph uh, to measure the uh, protection level in relation to the, uh, to the uh, neutralizing antibody level. Okay, so what affect antibody response and vaccine efficacy besides uh, the vaccine itself? Uh, antibody response in older group of people always show a lower result. What we see here in this line that the older people is in this graph, what we see that the seropositivity uh, comes uh, at a later stage than the younger people. And when we see the cutoff of the neutralizing antibody, it is lower. This is about uh, 100 and this is about 250. And this is with the uh, Sinovac vaccine. But uh, uh, me, I think me and my friend as a clinician and internal medicine, actually it's much concern with these people because uh, this patient who has older age, diabetes, heart disease, hypertension, malignancy, and so on, uh, are high risk of severe COVID. And these people has lower immune response, the older age, diabetes, chronic kidney disease, chronic obstructive disease, and malignancy and 
people with immunosuppressive drug and immunodeficiency. One paper shows that the antibody response rate among healthy control and chronic lymphocytic leukemia patients are significantly lower in the chronic lymphocytic leukemia. And this is even more severe. The difference is very, 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 very a lot. And then um, the antibody response of patient who gets uh, chemotherapy is uh, always also low. And I have an anecdotal, actually a case that uh, I uh, see myself. This is a husband and a wife. They both get vaccinated at 16 April and 12 April, 2021. But they got COVID in 12 May, 2021. And we did testing of RBD at day 10 of illness. And this patient is at seven days of illness. And what we found is that uh, the wife has anti-RBD result only 38.6, which is uh, below the seropositive uh, cutoff at 50. And the husband has 1,164 uh, anti-RBD, which is uh, above the 50 uh, cutoff. And the wife uh, happened to have severe disease and died, and the husband have mild disease and survive. So this shows that uh, the anti-RBD result can help us a little bit in the prognostic and probably uh, how we can treat this uh, patient. So uh, continuing to that, I will talk a little bit about how we use anti-RBD tests in patient management. Uh, one uh, thing we can use is that when we give uh, convalescent plasma treatment, uh, this is one paper uh, who only tells about five patients who get plasma treatment. But uh, surprisingly, they get plasma treatment with uh, a, very, very, a lot of variation of titer of RBD. You see here the donor one has 16,200, 16, donor two has 1,800, and what, three 1,800, four 5,000, and five, the fifth is 16,200. And what we see here in the graph that the, uh, the patient who gets uh, two and three, this is two and three, uh, are have very low uh, ELISA titer of uh, neutralizing antibody. So this is actually something we should do more in Indonesia because I see a lot of patients in Indonesia, a lot of times uh, the, 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 the clan fusion packet didn't tell us how much uh, titer of antibody they give. And second, uh, what Prof Ashok had, had said that if we test antibody uh, early before day 10, before day 14, uh, if the antibody doesn't show up, so that is related with uh, bad outcome. So what we see here, this is patient mounted a robust but delayed response of anti-RBD and neutralizing antibody level. And delayed seroconversion kinetics correlated with impaired viral control in patient who died. And neutralization antibody generation before day 14 of disease onset emerged as a key factor of recovery. What we see here is the purple line is the disease patient, patient with severe disease and died. And uh, the green one is the one who survived. What we see here is that uh, they mount antibody very quickly, the green one. So actually in any treatment uh, based on immuno, Im, immunotherapy, sorry, on antibody, we should aim to get high antibody titer at the beginning, actually on the first 10 days of uh, disease. And another preliminary data analysis, which uh, we did in uh, our department, is uh, we, uh, we uh, take note on all the patient who gets Sinovac, in, and this is in the last uh, three months, and I sort the result of the anti-RBD result in from low to high. And what we see here, the lower uh, patient, there are five patients, are, uh, they came with severe disease. Five of them have uh, the disease and four of them have severe and one died and the other are still hospitalized. And what we see here is that people who has uh, cirrhosis, uh, hepatic cirrhosis and uh, rheumatoid arthritis has a very low anti-RBD and are also asthma probably they take uh, anti-inflammatory medication. 
Okay, now uh, comes to the also very uh, a lot of question. Are we protected by our vaccine? How we determine that? Now, actually, uh, WHO has uh, helped us uh, by doing this because now in Indonesia, maybe in India, also elsewhere, there are so many uh, brand of uh, testing uh, uh, method, and I only put this. Uh, Four brand which we know the Abbott, the Siemens, the Rush, and Onefold, and the WHO has uh, provided established a standard to calculate all this uh, number to the uh, binding antibody unit. And how we calculated that? If you have the Siemens uh, result, you calculate it by uh, 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 multiplying the result with twenty one point eight. And you have an Abbott result, you multiply it by 0 0.142. And if you have a one for result, you multiply by 20. And, and I will give you the, the number later. And then the, the next good thing, this is just a paper just came from, uh, the, from the AstraZeneca group. And they calculated the, if the patient has anti-RBD of 165, what is the efficacy of the vaccine? And they come up with 70%. And based on their number, they can do mathematical modeling and everything. And from the anti-RBD, if they are 506, this is based on the, uh, the new unit uh, established by the WHO, they get 80% uh, efficacy. Okay, so this is actually the data that they show in the paper. It's rather complicated. This is the arbitrary unit based on the examination they do. And this is the binding uh, antibody unit based on the WHO established uh, new uh, standard. And what we see here is that 70% uh, protection is achieved if you have a 165 BAU. And 80% uh, is achieved if you have 506 and 90% protection you get if you have a BAU of 2360. So what we can say is that like this, if you have, uh, this is the binding antibody unit, 165, 506, and even higher. And if you use a Pfizer, then it is 175. If you use an Abbott, then it is 1,100, 3,000, and so on. If you have so on, four and semen, it's like this. The number of the, the, the number which I show on the previous slides was use uh, the Abbott uh, scale. So we call calculate in thousands of units. So what happened is that uh, if you have a 165 uh, titer of anti-RBD, then you can say that you, have, you are protected to about 70%. If you have four or six, then you are protected to about 80%. And if you have higher, then you are protected to 90%. Some, this graph is uh, presented by Xiu Feng. And then I can go back to the small study that we did in, in, in Bandung. And what we did here is we calculated the, uh, the measurement, which is before it was, uh, we calculated based on the BAU, on the binding antibody unit. And then we can say that the uh, BAU of 506 has 80% protection and BAU of 165 have 70% uh, of protection. So among our Sinovac recipient, we can see that this, amount, this number of patient gets 80% protection and this number of patient gets 70% protection and this number of patient gets less. I hope it's clear. And I think this is last uh, issue that we want to talk about, the waning of immunity and the waning of immunity is not only happened to the vaccine, which we know the Sinovac, but it's also happened in the uh, Pfizer, uh, also in the AstraZeneca. And actually the clinical implication of waning antibody uh, of post-vaccination are not yet clear. Whether if we are here, are we still protected as a, at, uh, at the percentage that we were here? Oh yeah, I forgot to tell you that the AstraZeneca uh, calculation here is based on the uh, uh, antibody titer measured at uh, 28 days post uh, second vaccine. So if you have test, if you test yourself at uh, month three or month six, 
uh, actually we don't really know how much you are protected. But if you are uh, pro projecting that uh, result to the to the day twenty eight, then you can use that uh, number. And uh, waning will will also determine by the uh, titer that you were started with. So maybe if you has uh, if you have a, a very good vaccine uh, at ninety percent at two hundred fifty days, then you will get to uh, about this number of percent. If assuming that neutralization uh, antibody is major mechanism for protection. I think that's also the conclusion, the benefit of uh, anti-RBD net or neutralization antibody test is that for the individual patient care, chief, uh, we can achieve optimal prevention measure in non-COVID subject, in healthy subject, which has not get COVID. If we evaluate their antibody response, especially in those with high risk or comor comorbidity, if low, we can uh, ask for booster with the same of or other vaccine. And then for traveling purpose, now there are more countries who want to ask for certificate of immunity. Now the, it is only provided to uh, Western vaccine, while the Sinovac has not got certification. But I think if we are using antibody, we can have a, a standard for certification. And for COVID patient, it has a prognostic value for uh, determining severity and probable of unfavorable outcome and evaluation on the need of uh, convalescent plasma therapy or for any other antibody therapy. And post illness, we can decide the need for vaccination when anti-RPD is already low. And of course, there is a role in community COVID prevention, like for surveillance to understand uh, the proportion of people who are seropositive or to know how, much, uh, how, how far we are from herd immunity. And then to, uh, to, to, we can also use this for targeting indicator for our vaccination coverage. Uh, for instance, for people who already uh, have uh, high anti-RBD, maybe the, these people doesn't uh, need vaccination. So it can be also used for efficiency of vaccine use or efficiency or of booster. So um, uh, our recommendation would be uh, without disturbing the national vaccine program, we would like to ask uh, probably the uh, policymaker to support the need for testing in high risk individuals, uh, especially for these people and provide access of vaccine for individual or clinical needs and endorse this capacity for clinician decision for these patients and integrate research in vaccine booster rollout for evaluating antibody response, breakthrough infection, and adverse effect. Uh, in the end, we, have, we hope we can use more vaccine option because now there are hundreds of vaccine will be available. So we have to know which and what to do uh, effectively and efficiently. I think that's all from me. I hope it's uh, quite clear. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Badi, to give us this very useful information and pointed out the exact reason why neutralizing antibody is so important and should be considered to apply, not just for post-vaccination, but also for COVID-19 patient. And also, I think the result interpretation suggestion that you gave is very meaningful and useful because you can you actually match the RBD result with the protection efficacy. And I think it's going to guide the future application. So thank you, Dr. Badi. Thank you. Uh, mm -hmm, thank you. So finish up the keynote speeches here. Uh, we shall proceed to the exciting QA session. Um, I saw a lot of questions popping up and here I, I got the first question. Uh, the first question I think is for both Professor Shock and Dr. Badi. Uh, can neutralizing antibody test guide and or help the vaccination program? when the vaccine resource is insufficient right now, and when vaccine is approachable by the majority of population in the future? I, I think it's the same question under two different scenarios. And I think the first half, half of the question is quite important, considering that India and the Indonesia and the China are all populous countries. So we may more, more likely to face the insufficient vaccine resource. So, uh, Dr. Badi, uh, could you uh, reply this question first? Um, yeah. 
the vaccine is not is limited. I know now. Now is limited. So actually, uh, what uh, needs who needs to get who needs to get vaccination is the uh, people who have high risk of COVID and people who will get ill because those people are uh, burdening the hospital and everything. And that is what we feel. And I think if we have a test that can show that these people have get uh, their vaccine uh, optimally means that they have reached the, the uh, tighter expected, then we can be assured. So uh, I'm not opposed of, of course, I'm, I'm supportive of getting vaccine to everyone. But if you uh, focus on everyone, sometimes you forget that these older people, uh, they get similar scheduling, but actually they are still not protected. So, so it's, a, it's a balance between who you want to protect. There is also an issue that also talk in the news that or, or in, the, in the publication that maybe children can, can wait. Uh, maybe this faction can be very focused on the people with high risk. And, and for that, I think we need uh, the help of the, of the uh, antibody testing. I hope, yeah. Professor thank you. Shark? Yeah, thank you. Uh, Professor Shak, do you want to add some point? Uh, I agree with what uh, Professor Badi said. And I would say that uh, neutralizing antibodies would help in deciding whether a person who has had uh, infection and one dose, does he need the second dose? So it can be sparing. One, of course, is, as it's been mentioned, that high risk must be protected first. And for high risk, you need two doses. You don't stop with one dose because that gives you inadequate protection, whichever, antibody, uh, whichever vaccine you're using. So high risk must get two doses at once. And if a person has had infection, then one dose of vaccine would top up the immunity. And if the neutralizing antibodies now are 99% or thereabout or above the threshold, then the second dose need not be taken. But those are the policy decisions looking at evidence. And again, in children, we know that children normally do not suffer from severe infection. They, they do become carriers and they can transmit to grandparents in the house. So uh, there is a risk there but more evidence is required. And I think neutralizing antibodies would be useful in deciding that, as well as in selecting which, and, uh, which vaccine would be best suitable for the population. Yeah, thank you, Professor Ashok and Dr. Badi. I think both of you mentioned that the neutralizing antibody can help the vaccine allocation to give the vaccine to people who really need it. And that is important currently. So uh, next question, uh, next question goes to Professor Ashok. Uh, currently, the biggest issue for pandemic control is the variants. Uh, can Professor Ashok instruct how we can choose vaccination in order to get maximized protection against the virus? Uh, can I know from my neutralized antibody level that I have been protected even, with, even against the virus? From all evidence, it, uh, it appears that vaccine, whichever type, is useful. The persons who have died are mostly unvaccinated. Pers if a person has been vaccinated, then he would have less chances of severe infection or getting admitted into ICU, even with the Delta variant. So complete your vaccination schedule as soon as possible. And then along with that, have COVID appropriate behavior. That means do not, for even if you're vaccinated and you have high titers, do not forget to wear the mask, keep social distancing and observe COVID appropriate behavior because the variant might still escape immunity. But the escape of, though the vaccines have been compromised to a certain extent by the variant, they are still effective. And at the back of our mind, we should keep that in mind that T cells may also be playing a role. At this moment, we don't have too much of data about cell-mediated immunity, 
but I'm sure it's also playing a role in protection. So uh, take the vaccine, take whichever vaccine is available, complete the vaccine uh, duration. Thank you. Thank you for the answers. Taking the vaccine is really important for everyone. Yeah. Yes. So uh, the third question I have here is for um, Dr. Badi. Um, hi, Dr. Badi. You have mentioned at the beginning of the speech, the WHO, CDC, and MOH in Indonesia don't recommend the test, the neutralized antibody test. Uh, could you comment on that a bit further? Uh, why the authorities think the test is unnecessary and what we should do in the future to make some changes of these authorities' recommendation? This, yeah, this question. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much for the question. <coughs> Yeah, um, I think that they are not, uh, I think the US, they have a very good vaccine at the efficacy of 95, 97%. Mm -hmm. So I think uh, when they calculate and thing and so on, I think they, they are sure that they can uh, be assured that the antibody response will be high. And actually they show it in their, uh, while we are observing them, they show it, and I think uh, President Biden or even said that you don't have to wear a mask if you are vaccinated in the U.S. But I think uh, I think that's why they they they, they don't uh, need because I I'm sure that if you roll out vaccination and then you roll out uh, testing at the same time, it becomes very complicated for the government. I, I understand the government will have that problem. Also in Indonesia, that if you roll out even the vaccine is not enough. Then you have to test it again. And then you have to make an administrative for millions of people administration system that is really very difficult. So I think they are, they are I think it's very difficult to make uh, that uh, uh, protocol to test. But I think uh, Indonesia is facing uh, a lot uh, a choice which they have to take whether to use uh, Sinovac again, whether to use a uh, vaccine A, B, C after this, there is a lot of other vaccine which come and they are, can be cheaper than the good vaccine of uh, Pfizer or Moderna. And we have to decide. Uh, so I think, um, so how do we tell the government to, to say this? I think uh, what we talk in this uh, presentation is how we say it. First, uh, let's prioritize testing for those who can get ill very severe. Thank you. I hope it's quite clear. Thank you for the answer. Um, I may, might add a little bit here. That please, yeah. there, is a, there is a difference between public health and personal health. Oh, the, yeah. the authorities will look at public health. That means they would do this for everybody. So antibody testing may not be required for everybody. But as I think we are trying to say that antibody testing, neutralizing antibody testing should be a personal decision that if you feel you have a comorbidity, if you feel that antibody may not, may not be effect, uh, the vaccine may not be effective, then you should get this done. And it's, as has been uh, mentioned, that if you have to select, then in a select which one, A versus B or C vaccine, then depending upon the response of the local population, you would then choose which one will be most cost effective. Sometimes costlier is cheaper. So it is not the cost of the vaccine, but the effect on the public health, which authorities need to take into consideration. So we are not advocating that the vaccine, that the antibody testing should be done with everybody. But if you have any indication, if you feel that you, you have comorbidity or the age is more than 65, then chances are that maybe the vaccine will not be effective. So in that case, or you are infected with a new variant, then in that case, you have to get the vaccination and then antibody done and which will be able to help you in taking appropriate decisions. Thank you. Thank you for uh, both experts. I think the is uh, very well answered this question. Uh, and uh, next question, 
uh, I think it should be our last question due to uh, we have uh, time restriction. Uh, like some countries have opened their booster shot, uh, like uh, Professor Shock mentioned. Uh, could you comment on the necessity of booster shot, uh, how neutralized antibody or anti RBD antibody can tell when booster shot uh, when booster shot can be injected? I think it's for both both experts. Yeah, maybe uh, Professor Shock, you go first. Uh, I think booster shot should not be of the same again and again. Uh, if now the now the variant is Delta, which is causing infection, which has at least 17 mutations from the original strain, then the booster should be from the Delta, the, R, the RNA or the proteins of the spike protein of Delta variant. And then that variant will make sure, one is we are sure that antibodies protect. Maybe T cells also play a role but we can quantify antibodies. And so if a booster, booster would be required as the, antibody, as the antibody titer wanes, then a booster which takes care of the recent variant is the one that will be useful. Yes, thank you very much. I think the booster shot, the booster shot is necessary, especially those who are uh, have a low titer in immunity. They are high risk. They have, uh, uh, yeah, they, we can, uh, they are quite ill or elderly. And I think the, uh, the booster shot can benefit a lot from the testing uh, of vaccination, uh, from the testing of the antibody. If the antibody is low, then the, the indication for doing booster is much more higher. And then uh, when we choose the vaccine for booster, actually there is uh, not so much evidence yet of uh, what vaccine to be used. Uh, even to have the third dose of similar Sinovac vaccine, uh, we don't know how, how, uh, how, in, how good is the increase in the titer. But if you can mix, I think that's much better, but we still need to uh, get gain experience uh, because uh, maybe Sinovac is good enough because I know that the Pfizer and, and the Moderna may be very expensive. Maybe the AstraZeneca is much cheaper and can get even uh, as good as, as the Pfizer. And there is also some other vaccine will come on the market. And then uh, we can also uh, have that choices. So I think it's important that the government also uh, arrange uh, research within the implementation of the booster so that we can get a quick, quick answer and doesn't have to wait for another additional clinical trial, which, uh, which takes too long. I see. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Badi. Um, so due to time, uh, due to limited time, uh, this will be the end of our today's section. Uh, thank you, Professor Ashok and Dr. Badi, for answering these questions. Um, and uh, if you, if our audience want a further talk, please send the email. Please send the question to the email sent in the chat box. Uh, we will forward the question and get back with answers. Um, and so far, um, our webinar is coming to the end. Uh, thank you, Professor Ashok and Dr. Badi for giving us this very instructive and informative keynote speech. Uh, Wonderful is also trying to contribute our own efforts in this period. Uh, we have launched uh, several products related with neutralized antibody and RBD antibody. Uh, and for, for helping with the vaccination and COVID-19 patients. Uh, the products are based on our four platforms. Uh, the first one is Colloidal Gold. Uh, it can yield qualitative results and can help in the initial screening, like Professor Shark mentioned. And the immune fluorescent platform can yield very quick quantitative result with relative simple operation to facilitate the evalu evaluation at point of care setting. And also we have the neutralized antibody test based on chemiluminescence and ELISA, uh, which could have a high throughput testing. Uh, 
uh, help as much and as quick as possible. And if you're interested, uh, please contact our corresponding sales manager and or uh, send to the email sending in the chat box for the further inquiry. And again, uh, many thanks to Dr. Badi and Professor Ashok for joining us today. Uh, we really appreciate all your sharing and work you have done and are doing uh, for the good of the human health. And no doubt there are hundreds of thousands of healthcare workers researchers, lab technicians are still working in the front line for fighting for a COVID-free world. One for would like to take this opportunity to say thank you to all of you. Uh, when you're out there fighting the disease and saving people's lives, please remember the extra pair of work and always safe comes first to you. Um, last but not the least, uh, thank One for Biotech and the Indonesian Infectious Society, uh, Infectious Disease Society for presenting this webinar giving us this opportunity to have the conversation with experts in this field. Uh, One for Biotech will have upcoming webinar focusing on POC application in pediatrics. Please follow the One for official account on LinkedIn, Twitter, or Facebook to acquire the latest information. Looking forward to see you again. So thank you, Professor Ashok and Dr. Badi. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you, Prof. Ashok. Thank you, Amber. Thank, thank you, you One for. Thank you, and thank you all audience, yeah, very nice.